Hello and welcome to the Unofficial Controller Podcast, your weekly gaming podcast. Episode 47, the history of Capcom, the early years. With me, George, and as always joined by Tom, Mega Man, to my not-so-great man. How's it going? <laughs> Hiya, mate. Uh, yeah, I'm very well. Did that intro appeal to your ego? It did, yeah. Good. Anything that boosts it is good with me. <laughs> it's the only reason this show exists. It is. So, for the new listener... We're going to just give them a quick rundown. So I normally ask you what you're hoping to play, and then we slip into the news, and then we delicately untie the dress, which is the feature, and then wham, bang, Stingray turns up. We do the new releases, and then I ask you what you're hoping to play. And those that got the attention span of about 30 seconds are probably thinking, Tom, grip the wheel, Odders. What you been playing? So busy this week. I've been playing loads of Mad Max. Ah. Your recommendation. Uh, one really finally got stuck. stuck. It. I, it has, yeah. It's taken uh, nearly a year, but one stuck, and I'm really, en- really enjoying that. Hmm. It has made me go uh, and watch the Fury Road yet again. <laughs> I love that film. Play the game, live the game. Now, I've got a few problems with it. I wish it was the game or the film. The, the game. Oh. I love the film. I, I can't really pick a fault with the film. Um, wow. <laughs> honestly, it's one of those that I just like. I love all of it. Okay. Um, the game, Chum Bucket, is a problem for me. Now, mm. I know he's a gameplay mechanic, but he is just. He's constantly there, and then you used to see in the Interceptor in the films, and obviously in Fury Road. Not really a spoiler because it happens really like five minutes into the film, it's gone. Comes back slightly later on, all souped up and whatnot. But it just feels strange having him there and he's talking. And sometimes you just want to enjoy the wasteland. They've done such a great job of visualizing that world. And it's it like, it does look good, doesn't it? The skies and the um, sort of the mirage of the flames of the, what I presume is going to be the gas town. Yes, uh, I've not got there yet. Obviously, I guess that's end game, maybe. Uh, or maybe not. He's giving me a look. We'll see. Maybe, maybe not. But no, really good game. I wish I'd have played that when it come out. Um, I like the way that when the sun comes on the desert, you almost can't see anything on the screen. Yeah. It oh, man. Oh, out, man. Doesn't it? No, no. I know I wanted to talk about a specific part, and it was the st- a storm. I got stuck in a storm. Oh, that is good. And it's like you catch like a bump slightly wrong, so I got involved in a chase as well. They were like chasing me down. I was really low on health, and the car was battered. Yeah. And like one little bump, and it like flicks the car and kind of floats it because of this storm that you're in, and it just yeah. really that adds a Fury Road vibe to it. Because obviously it there's does. a scene in that where they go into a great big sandstorm and. Or a bit well we'll get to what I've been playing shortly and I'll give you my thoughts on okay. that Max um, anything else yeah I downloaded the Call of Duty Battle Royal Warzone Ooh. really good I'm impressed with that though. yeah uh, it's available free to play to everyone <coughs> it's a rather large update though if you're gonna if you don't own the core game I think it's between 80 to 100 gigabytes to download it again free to play so if you've got a decent sized hard drive on your console or PC, well worth a play. It's cross play as well, so you can play against friends on Xbox, PlayStation, or PC. Nice, nice little add on that. Uh, what I was gonna say, if you have the console version, you probably already know, but it's about forty gigabytes to download. Yeah, I've been enjoying a few drops on that. It seems can you play that? On your own, or can you make yeah, a team? You can, How many you people can, can you um, have in a team? You can be solo, uh, a two or a three. You can just match make and find some randoms if you want to. Hmm. Uh, the only problem with that is sometimes people just go off on their own, whereas normally if you're a proper organised team, you'll drop in one place and work together. Yeah, plays really well. I know it's Battle Royal again, but they've got some fresh ideas. In Do you parachute like. in? Yep, parachute in. Fresh ideas? Fresh ideas. So, no, <laughs> we, we, we joke and we knock it. I mean, maybe it doesn't do anything too revolutionary, but the uh, gulag prison idea, so you get one chance of survival again if, you, if you're killed in the game, or you, you kind of put to a point where you in a little cutscene, you're dragged to the prison. It's quite cool. And then you could be watching, uh, you're on a second floor of the prison waiting for your match to happen. 
Mm-hmm. But what happened is uh, one of my teammates was in his match and I could watch him like I was trying to give him advice. I didn't give him very good advice because I told him the wrong my left rather than his left and then he died. Classic you. Yep. Uh, so that's pretty cool and then that can get you uh, like respawned back into the game but that's it one chance only next time you die you're dead and gone what is the mechanic that gets you respawned uh, you just parachute in again yeah, um, but what you, you die oh you're so sorry like you have a one versus one against another random player who's in that situation so uh, you I can see. be waiting in there a few minutes just for it to queue to find someone else who's died uh, and then whoever wins the one versus one goes back into the game which is a neat little idea and I think uh, quite cool can see a few other people doing that. It's uh, about 150 players on the map at the minute, but they're trying to get it up to 200, so that's pretty impressive. Oof, that's yeah. Oof. Um, I think if they put it up to 200, they should maybe do like teams of five or four, maybe. It might work better. Well, it's been playing more Battlefront 2, another online shooter, but it's it's really good that. I tried the uh, space battles as well. They have a nice feel to them. The controls are a little bit awkward. Um, so you're kind of using the joystick to boost forward or like air brake or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you sort of steering and manoeuvring is on the other stick. Once you get used to it, it plays real nice. Mm. I think that would definitely be worth playing in VR if you've got a VR headset. It's not in VR. I thought they did a Star Wars. Or was that just a standalone? It's a standalone to okay. one. Right. Which I've played. Ah, okay. Any it's good? It's a 20 minute mission that you kind of, you kind of locked into. I think I probably asked you but. It's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. If, de- if you've got battle, There's if you've there, uh, there? got um, PSVR and you haven't picked up a, a very cheap copy of EA's mm. Battle Star Wars Battlefront One, yeah, on PS4, um, you're missing out on a pretty good VR experience actually because it's a little free add-on as well. Nice. Mm. Yeah. What else is in this list of uh, encyclopedia of games? A uh, little bit more Shadow Colossus. It's it's hard sometimes to just keep dipping in and out of quite a few different games okay. like when I haven't got that much free time try how many to concentrate on one how many classes have you had a go at now I think getting close to the end I'm on 13 or 14 I think Ooh. so yeah it'd be nice to take that off the list finish the remaster yeah I recommended it to a few people as well because um, it was recently or still is I think available as the PlayStation Plus game yeah. of the month along with uh, The Sims maybe or something else I don't know um, yeah well worth a play if mm. you've not picked it up already. I think that'll do me. I've not played much Switch this week. Really still holding... If anyone owns a Switch who listens, I'm curious to know your thoughts on are we going to get Nintendo Direct anytime soon? Because it's the longest... Lots of people who listen own a Switch. Right. Hopefully so. We have a lot of listeners. We do. Um, it's been a, the longest period ever of not having a Nintendo Direct, and I think they're probably waiting until Animal Crossing, the first big first party release, comes out, and then they'll do one after that to show what the roadmap of the rest of the year, or at least the sort of the rest of the next couple of seasons are. Mm. Um, so it's a bit of a waiting game, as always, with them. They move in mysterious ways. They very much they do, do, don't they? Um, but we've got a bit of Nintendo news coming up in the news. We so, have, uh, yes. We'll get to that, but first of all, I'll ask you what you've been playing. Ooh, okay, so you've been playing Mad Max. I finished that. Whoa. So I went Boom. through, did the end game. Um, <coughs> I don't want to spoil it for you or anyone who hasn't played it, so I won't go too deep into it, but the, uh, the end, the actual end section, it's quite cool. You know, it was obviously car based, which is what obviously you're probably looking for. Um, but it had more of a traditional boss fight. I thought about, I don't know, a couple of hours before that, and you don't really get to end that section when you want to. Okay. But it ends out on the road, so ah. I mean that's cool. But yeah. the I don't know, I felt a bit tacked on. Yeah. But my overall impressions on completing it were positive. I had a good yeah. time. Uh huh. Um, you could get to carry on and then finish off all the different quests that you may have had open. Yeah. Um, which is a little bizarre considering some of the stuff that happens, but you know, oh, okay. go with it. Right. Um, if you don't even hold back when you end the game, it's like, this has happened, but do you know what? Deal with it. It's like, oh, right. It's funny. Sometimes games revert to like <laughs> the last save so you can uh, act as though you've never finished the game, do all the side missions and then finally tick it off but some will move past that point won't they and 
yeah. have it carry on after the credits. So like I say, I enjoyed that. More importantly, I don't know why, but the PSVR headset was just sat there staring at me. So I thought, do you know what? Oh, I'm yeah. going to get back into this. Uh -huh. So I slotted the headset on and I, uh, I got about halfway through Blood and Truth, the PSVR game, where yep. you're like, Ryan. This was one of the first like full titles, wasn't it? Like yeah, it was like what I would call the second wave of AAA games that came out. Obviously, yeah. when you get a PSVR headset, you get the PlayStation World's demo disc, and on there is a level called London Heist, mm -hmm. which was I've like the that forebear. You demoed that to me. Yeah. yeah, the forebear to this to this game, um, but it's so much more than that. So there's all the ideas in there that you were like, oh, they were good. Yeah, which they've expanded upon. So you've got a vape in this yeah. one. Instead of the cigar, although I did open a safe, I cracked a safe, and in there was a a little nod to the original game, London yeah. Heist, because you steal a diamond, oh. and you pick it up, and it's a note, and it just says, don't get too excited, it's a few weeks ago in here. <laughs> and then there's a cigar that you can light, yeah, because you obviously you smoke a cigar in that pub scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I tell you what, I wasn't too sure about it when I first played it, but picking it up again and blasting through it, I when I finished it, so I'm the man who finishes games. <laughs> when I finished it, I came away from that. I was grinning from ear to ear. It's been so long since I've had that much fun in a game. Yeah. And it made me sort of crave more mm. PSVR titles that were like that. And I've yeah. got Farpoint, which is like an alien-based one. I've seen that, yeah. Uh, with, the, with the move gun. Did you play uh, Blood and Truth with the control pad or the move controllers? With the move controllers. Yeah. One thing I would say about that is I came out of that game grinning from ear to ear because of the, the, the freedom the that the move controllers gave yeah. me. If I'd have been playing that with the DualShock, yeah. it would have just been a bit meh. Yeah. Um, not even close to an experience yeah. that I had. And just the levels were great. I mean, without giving too much away... The end credits that you see just before that happens, you're in a plane explosion and you pull a parachute and you sort of parachute over nighttime London while watching all the wreckage burning around you of this plane. And it's like no other game would have given you that experience. Obviously, you've played games where you've been in planes that exploded before, and we've been in games where you can parachute before, and admittedly, you didn't have a lot of control over this, but just the experience of it all happening. And the build up to that point was amazing. You know, I've, uh, it's in the trailer, so it's not spoiling too much. But getting in a car and getting up behind, being driven up behind the undercarriage of a plane on the runway. Was it like that experience when you're younger, probably a teenager, Saturday night, there's one of them classic action films on the TV, and you just sit and enjoy and have a great time? Yeah, but imagine being in it. Wow. Exactly. Even better. And there, and you know, there's. I normally want to have full movement, but in this game, you kind of move between hot spots. But you walk, your character walks between them. Um, I never questioned it once when the action was flowing. I never questioned it once. Mm. I never felt like. Uh, in fact, it sucked me into the game more. The more it was, uh, you know, you'd look to an area and you press the move button, your character sort of walks or slides to that area, yeah, and then you pop round some cover, and it's it's like a hybrid of like the best um, light gun game you've ever played. I was just about to say, is it? But you're in it to a light gun experience. Yeah, it's very similar so to that, but you're in it on a ratio of like percentages. Would you say like it's I don't know eighty percent gunfights and then a little bit of twenty percent story and and is there any puzzles to solve or interactive? Yeah, um, you're a super army soldier. Don't forget <laughs> that. So this is the explanation for some of yeah. the reasons why you're doing what you're doing and you're so good at the stuff yeah. that you do. And uh, sometimes you come across a locked door and an alarm system and you've got this little... Um, I wish I'd played it more when it first came out. But anyway, you've got this zipper case that you kind of gameplay mechanic just kind of zips to the wall but again you never question it when you're in the headset and it's got two lock picks at the bottom and it's got some other bits it's got a screwdriver like a one of those ratchet screwdrivers so you kind of pick that up with the move controller yeah. and you kind of you can feel it you know they've got that little ratchet mechanism oh yeah yeah so you're like zup, zup, zup. that's cool and then as you pull it off you naturally now i checked this it wasn't me that was doing it it was the animation 
but without thinking. You know when you undo a screw and then you shake the screwdriver to drop it on the floor? Yeah. That was part of the animation. It just <laughs> pulled. I thought I was doing it, but I wasn't doing yeah. it. It sort of pulled you into the world, and then you obviously you unscrew these things, and you, you've got some snippers that you take off, and you kind of snip the different wires and put a little um, relay to blow circuits in there, and yeah. it opens doors. And There's so much they can do with that, because it's just replicating using your own hands, isn't it? Well, like the way it ends, it kind of suggests, because it starts out as... as well, it starts off as you're like a super army soldier, then you get back home, because I think from memory, you've, your father's been killed and you go to the funeral or you, you go back to comfort your family. Yeah. And um, it feels at that moment like it's a Guy Ritchie movie. Mm -hmm. But if anyone's looking at the game and they're not sure and they think, oh, well, I don't know, don't worry. It isn't really that. It's much more like your James Bond or John McClane or yeah. um, John Wick. It's more like that. Okay. And that's the sort of premise. The gunplay, it's awesome you can throw a clip in the air and catch it in the bottom of your gun there's all sorts of cool bits really good game nice recommend and then to back up the games what else i've been doing in the uh so i finished that i went and played a bit more farpoint because i got stuck on this i think a lot of people have got stuck on this based on some of the stuff i've seen online there's a spider boss <laughs> and i've tried all the different ways of doing yeah. it up front and it's because there's full locomotion in that. I think there are like tra tele teleport moves that you can use, but because it's full locomotion, after about 30 minutes or maybe an hour, of, I think I've been in it, I was in it longer than that, because further to your point, I think when you in, you should have a VR game, you should have a watch that tells you the real-time time. Yeah, Do you remember good. that thing that you came out with? What was that? You came out with a game when in VR, they ought to have your watch on your arm be the time oh yeah the yeah. game the real world yeah. time far point beat you to it it had uh, it on there so <laughs> let's get the lawyer on the phone you better add and uh i spent quite a long time in there trying all these different ways of killing him and and in the end even i got a bit of the old vr took the headset off and i was sweating yeah. but it was like a, a white face sweat it was <laughs> like oof, <laughs> oof. i yeah. better call that now <laughs> and it takes about maybe five ten minutes for that to wear off but Again, it's because it was very fast paced. I think if I if I wasn't taking that guy down, I'd be absolutely fine to play it for ages. But because you kind of close in and things are up and close, never an issue with Blood and Truth. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it so polished. Yeah, not one bit of any VR legs or nothing in there. You're just absolutely loving it. Yeah, I could have played Blood and Truth twenty hours straight, not had an issue. We stood or sitting. Blood and Truth, I, s I sat for. Yeah. Which did feel a bit weird at times. I mean, you you are aware when you're sitting that, but because in Blood and Truth you f you you switch between being stood and crouched in the game, sat playing that game didn't feel as much of a compromise yeah. as you think it might. Uh -huh. uh, obviously, you feel like you're six foot tall when you're only sat down and you're four foot off the ground or whatever it is. But that, none of that matters in the game. Well, um, and I've also been playing. Transformers War for Cybertron. I think that's the sequel to Fall of Cybertron, whichever one's the second game. Yeah. Thoroughly recommend that to anybody. Mm -hmm. Great game. And one last one. Bear with me. Because we play games on the gaming podcast. I never got to I never got to play Dead Space the first time uh, around. Yeah. You messaged me about this, didn't you? Mm hmm. I can see why it was scary back in 2000, mm. whenever it was that it came out, eight. Yeah. It's not very scary now. Is it not? No. Not at all. Even if I play it with the lights out, I'm like, mm, not scary. It's very much resi it's modern, got some modern Resident Evil, isn't it? With it the it's Resident over Evil the shoulder. 4, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. Um, I, like the mechanic, I like the mechanic of slicing limbs off. Yeah, that's great. I like... Um, the right trigger to flick the gun round so you can go for vertical slice or horizontal slice. Have you got any of the other weapons yet? Ah, oh, dude, I'm annoyed with myself because I thought there was an achievement or trophy for finishing it with the plasma gun. Oh, the, you okay. know, the the slicer one. Yeah, yeah. But I thought that it meant... I thought what, the, the pistol, the normal pistol? The normal yeah. pistol. I thought it meant that as long as you didn't have any traditional weapons... So I was using the Ripper Saw as well. Yeah. And then I looked through the trophy list and it was like, no, finish <laughs> the game with only the pistols. <laughs> God! 
So I've already thrown that up the Swanee. Yeah. So I might pick up some of the other weapons because I've got a lot because I haven't bought any of the other weapons mm. and I've only upgraded the suit once. I've got yeah. an awful lot of cash. Cash rich, as they say mm-hmm. in the Dead Space world. But they don't. I've just made that up. I think for me, that's one of always the, the fun things is getting the upgrades. That's why I've, I've quite been drawn to Mad Max. And uh, there's... I don't know, it just makes you feel stronger and that you can tackle different areas. And mm. There's some real cool stuff in Dead Space as well, like weaponry-wise. Um, well, it's like I fun. say, uh, there's... I mean, a million people have said it before me, but I like the way the UI is incorporated into the suit. Yeah, that's the health. Nice. But more than that, I like the way that the, the whole UI is built around the suit. So if you're yeah. watching a video... So it isn't the health bar on the back of his suit from yeah, what I remember? Everyone's it's a long talked time. about yeah, that. It's, it's time boring. Time. Everyone knows about yeah. that. I'm talking that there's also a little holler emitter underneath your chin that yeah. puts the videos up mm-hmm. in front of you. Yeah. And obviously you can pan the camera around and see them from the other angle yeah. if you want to, which I thought was good. And if you um, listen to an audio log, that pops up on the right-hand side as well. Yeah. So and, and even the inventory emanates from your underneath hollow chest emitter. Yeah, and and that's displayed. Obviously, you can't really pause the game. You can pause the game, but you can't pause the game to look through your inventory either, mm-hmm. which is is cool because it creates that sense of tension that you're always, if you're trying to inventory manage, when you're under duress, let's yeah. say in the game, that creates a level of tension and anxiety that I think when the game was brand new, eleven years ago or whatever it is, that would have been pretty scary I think visually as well the first one I think it looks good it holds up yeah but obviously compared to modern games it's it's not close and I think that lack of fidelity really just pulled me out of the world it very much mm-hmm. felt like a video game with video gaming mechanics they seem like games that we will either get remastered or maybe even get another one I feel that that franchise isn't fully instead dead. of seeing another one I would actually just like them to s- just fix and upgrade the textures yeah. and push through what they've already got. Because okay. I think the actual core mechanic, gameplay mechanics are good. Uh, and I think the way they use the environment to tell a story, like the, them popping out the vents, mm. people that you're interacting with getting killed or yeah. taken away, and certain things happening in front of you the way they do. Is, is, is a real joy. I, like I say, I can see why it was lauded at the time, um, but unfortunately, because the way the visuals are, I just feel like I'm playing a, a good game. <laughs> Not a great one. No. i tell you one thing that did really grind my gears. What's that? Really ground my gears. Camera? Not the camera, per se. Uh, I'm about roughly halfway through it now and I think it was at the end of level 4 start of level 5 there was this they decided that I needed to use a laser turret to right. shoot rocks down do you remember this one? oh yeah, yeah 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 oh god so I think sometimes stuff like that is put in to break up what they feel it's reached a point in the game where they're like, oh, we better just put something different in. Oh, well, break it uh, up. the radar got to that level, I think. Have you been outside yet? Mm-hmm. You go outside like, sort to of get like, to that. Do you like, for, it's a long time since oh, there's played, a few do you like dive where you're, where you're in like zero gravity yeah. and then you have to lock on your boots? Y- I've been in zero gravity and I've been in vacuum as well. That, I think that's several cool. times. Yeah. I like it. I like the fact that the air runs out yeah. um, when you're outside. I'll, the zero gravity. Doesn't it go really quiet as well? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the zero gravity is cool because it kind of flips levels on its head. So yeah. you want to be up there and you kind of zoom up there. It's a yeah. bit glitchy when your boots clank to the floor yeah. and then the level basically just. Yeah, but you know, that's I me. think there's ideas in there that at the time were were really good and and very oh, like strong. Like I say, if I'd have played that when it launched, I'd be raving about yeah, it right now. Definitely. But having not played it at the time, and I, I mean, at the end of the day, talk about value. I think I picked it up for fifty p. <laughs> Is this physical or digital? Physical, yeah. I think digital would still be the mega bucks, wouldn't it? You know <laughs> how that works Exactly. <laughs> Plus cranking your arm up your back for all the DLC. But yeah, for 50p as a pickup out there in the wild, uh, you can't say no, can you? No. What great value. Definitely. Well, that probably rounds out what we call the what you been playing section. Yeah. So others can relax. Both hands back on the wheel as we steer clean 
into the news. We've scoured the very darkest regions of the internet to bring you the latest stories. First up, Tom. Don't breathe. Oof. Unless you've been living in a nuclear bunker this week, the coronavirus pandemic claims another event victim. E3 is cancelled. But don't panic. Many of the other developers who are going have pledged to do some digital events, including Microsoft, Nintendo, Ubisoft and Warner Brothers. Uh, many other companies will also be looking at ways to showcase their products over the year. And to top it off, we'll do our own E3 live from Farmerton to get you that vibe. Nice. I like that. So we'll accumulate all the news of that week or month that yeah. the big E3 would normally be at. And We're obviously, I think. Lasso it all, bring it to you, and let you know what's going on. Corral it. Yeah. Get it, get it in a farmed up area. Surely there's so much information to share with. Because Sony are going to do something eventually, even if they weren't going to be at E3, they're going to be doing something to promote the Have PS5. Have they got a new console coming out? I think so. You'd barely yeah. know, though, would well, you? Well, yeah. <laughs> they, are pl- they talk about playing the cards close they're to the They're doing their own work on the school bus on the way into school. They, uh, yeah, they are. <laughs> leaving it very late. A um, lot of sort of rumours floating out there of like what Warner Brothers were going to show, and that was quite exciting. Do I want to see another Batman game from them? They were talking, they were going to show, this was potentially their E3 lineup. new Batman game, <sighs> whatever Rocksteady were working on. Oh, of course, sorry, I thought yeah, Rocksteady so were yeah, being yeah, forced no, to no. make another Batman yeah. game, but they're not, are they? Someone else is doing Batman yeah. under the Warner Brothers franchise. And RPG, Harry Potter. I'm actually quite excited for that. How could you not be? Even if you're not a big Harry Potter fan, the idea of that world in an RPG style game would just be fantastic yeah are we presuming that's coming to current gen consoles or is it going to now be yeah an Xbox you, i think X? it might be one of the a uh, lot of people hoping it's not going to be one of those live service games they'd better not do that no i mean let's face it what we want what we really really want i'm sick as they are is we <laughs> want uh we want to be able to roam all Hogwarts. We don't want any of this online paywall nonsense. I want to buy yeah. a disc or download it. I want to have a story that takes me from A to B. Yeah. If rumours are to be believed, and we're talking about rumours from probably a year ago when this got released sneaky, shaky cam style to the internet where everyone was like, is this real? Is this not real? Mm-hmm. If you remember. Um, and I was, the rumours were that it was based around Hogwarts maybe 30, 40, 50 years before you arrive there as Harry uh, as Harry Potter arrives at Hogwarts himself. Oh, really? Yeah, that would to me would be enough distance for things to be... So then they don't have to rely on a cast of characters from the films. Yeah. They can have X, Y, and Z as the, as the head. Yeah, they'd be better to do they that. ABC as yeah, the teachers. Definitely. No, they're all classic one of these moments. They're always going to have sort of character alike so I'm like yeah. I, I guarantee you the headmaster's going to be very Dumbledore <laughs> but yeah. well, it would be really it would be really nice if it was set in a different well away era. from that yeah definitely I think um, for me they could maybe do one game per school year that would be the way I think it'd be better to do that it might take oh no on. I want seven years and I want to do a full st- <laughs> really I, do a full stint. I also want to take the exams Okay. I want to go to the lessons like bully. I want to learn things. Yeah. And then I want a year later, not maybe 356 I in-game years, the days, and then you... 356? <laughs> <laughs> Leave you. <laughs> Whatever. And then you have to kind of perfect your spells at the year-end exams, and that's mm. how you kind of cast them permanently into your spell repertoire. Yeah, if you write this if you down get, if you're I'm listening. On it, I'm on it. <laughs> um, I, I really think you would like Fire Emblem Three Houses based on that. Do you think? Yeah, definitely. That game I never finished. We better move on to the next bit of news anyway. Oh, we yes. Got. Well, Brick Breaker. In some ninty news, Lego and Mario have combined forces to bring you Lego Mario, a new interactive way to play with your favourite bricks and plumber due to launch later this year but sadly no news on costs as of yet Tom park the car a minute yeah. spark up the MG Maestro Turbo we utilise to travel in time let's go forward in time let's get someone's inst- let's get someone's phone and look at Instagram oh my goodness gracious me 
There's a hell of a lot of Nintendo collectors with their Nintendo Lego in and around their Switch console, in and around their Nintendo collection of games. Am I wrong? Is this no, for kids? No, you're not wrong. Or is this for grown-up collectors? Because no, the for play me, this functionality is for to me looks weak even for a kid. No, I think kids would enjoy that. I think if my little boy was old enough, I'd probably want him to play or get him that. I think it looks real cool what you can do, and it's very interactive. But it's definitely going to be bought by adult Nintendo fans as well. Definitely. If, if they're into that, uh, maybe just to keep as a collector's item. They're buying two of everything. They are. You won't be able to yeah. buy it for your kid. It'll be sold out. Yeah. Dirty. I'll get it. I'll get two. <laughs> Both in the lot. Box, one box. One Both on boxed. Shelf. Both box on one on shelf, one in attic. Both in attic. Oh, really? It's a real accumulator, that Okay. One. Yeah. I think it's a strange choice the way they went with that. It's definitely surprised me. I thought we were just going to get like a version of like Lego Star Wars. I can't see it being cheap with that colour screen no, incorporated into not. Mario's chest and face. I did think you? they might have some kind of interaction with the NFC technology they've got for the Amiibo. Maybe replicate that with like Lego figurines. That's the way I thought it'd go, but it's yeah, it's interesting. Maybe to see we what will done. see that. Maybe you've just yeah. called it early, as you always. Yeah, do. I mean, as we've seen with all the other big sort of franchise, you know, fran- like licenses, they've gone. Yeah, they do a bit of everything, don't they? They do. Yeah. Last bit of news, Tom. Give me that. I write the songs. You write the words. What's this all about? HBO have got a Last of Us show coming up. Uh, many of you know um, who did the score. Gustavo Santala, um, he made he did the game soundtrack, and he's also good news has been snapped up by HBO, and will be scoring the new show. Uh, Santala is no stranger though to TV and film. Uh, he's scored two consecutive Academy Awards for Brokeback Mountain and Babel, or Babel. So he's uh, he's. Well known in the TV and film industry, I never realised that. I thought he was just a, a guy who scored gaming soundtracks. Mm. Your favourite movie as well. So he's winning <laughs> on all fronts yeah. there. I know you like Fable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Way ahead of me. Oh yeah. Didn't want to dig myself in. The I hole. don't think you can do a Last of Us show without that music and not have that music yeah. in there. It's iconic. Yeah, it's quite minimal. Um, yeah, but but it's got its own it. style, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I and think that's gonna, what makes it. I really hope that will... Uh, I think that will definitely help I the show. Classic me, I played that game after everybody else had played it. Yeah. And I think if it hadn't been for that... If it hadn't been for that music, I think it I think it might have been a little bit underwhelming for me. Mm. That music actually held it together and, and gave yeah. it some emotional clout. That and Ghost of Tsushima... You Obviously can imagine, I tell you what, it's quite a maturely put together game because that probably, if that had come out when PS3 and Xbox 360 had first come out, it would have been very mega power chord heavy and it would have been, fair, 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 <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, but definitely. As it came out as a, a PS3 swan song, much like the sequel's going to be a PS4 swan song, it it had it grown. And Naughty Dog had obviously grown in maturity off the back of the um, Uncharted trilogy that they'd cranked out. Obviously, before mm. that, they'd cranked out platform games, mm. and then they, f- you know, and Crash and all that sort of nonsense. And then they crank out Uncharted, and then they crank out Last of Us, uh, and it just felt like they'd reached a certain age and it matured, and the music was for me, it really was a fundamental part of that, and it showed yeah. that. Less is more. Well, they had him play at their E3 presentation, didn't they, when they showed uh, the last of his footage. I think they had him playing on guitar. Was that him, or was it just a stunt double? <laughs> playing we'll never, we'll never know. acoustic guitar. And we'll probably never see that again. No, with, never. Uh, no, that Sony been erased yeah. from history. Well, Tom, did we miss anything? Obviously, we probably did. Uh, do you have an opinion or take on the news we missed? If so, Tom, how do the collective masses get in contact with this mega star of a podcast and let us know as always you can reach us on instagram direct messages or comment on one of our posts which Mm -hmm. we always love to see you can also direct messages on twitter but please don't forget you can always email at unofficialcontrollerpodcast.com if only after however many shows you knew the email address 
questions at unofficialcontrollerpodcast.com. It's time, probably time, we got you wearing that jumper with all the contact details it on is. again that uh, our mother knitted for you. Tom, you know what? When all said and done, we've now arrived at the feature, and we've got a we've got an interesting one this week. We we normally do a console deep dive, and we've done a game series deep dive, and we've I don't know what else we've deep dived all the levels of uh, depravity you can <laughs> think of, I should imagine. But this week we decided to do something different. We picked a powerhouse. Yeah, we're going to be we're going to be in the future looking at some of the developers. Yeah. Uh, we've got a few in mind, haven't we? We sure have. Yeah, um, we're going to be looking at their history, and bec- especially the big ones. We're going to be probably breaking those down into two shows if, yeah. if they've got a big enough his- don't uh, turn back up, catalog. Don't turn up next week expecting the history of Capcom feature part two, because we're going to spread them out a little bit. Okay. You write the songs. Well, you don't write the words. <laughs> James writes. So the words. who have we got first? Well, we chose Capcom, the history of Capcom feature. Um, Capcom, known worldwide for its smash hit franchises such as Street Fighter, Mega Man, Resident Evil and Monster Hunter, started its life way back in 1979 as IRM Corporation, founded by Kenzo Chijimoto. Starting as a subsidiary company of IRM, Japan Capsule uh, Commuters Co. Limited, developed and distributed early arcade cabinets. The two companies went under a name change to Sambico before finally amalgamating into Capcom, an abbreviation of a former name, the Capsule Computers Co. Capsules was chosen because they felt it alluded to, and we quote, a capsule packed to the brim with gaming fun. So you can see what they did there. This all played to them protecting their intellectual property in its words, with a hard outer shell preventing illegal copies and third party clones. Entering into a new name and solidifying as Capcom we know in 1981 to create arcade cabinets, which it would solely manufacture for its founding years, they hoped the name would separate them from the burgeoning home computer scene and make them out, mark them out as arcade specialists. Capcom's first product was a coin-op cabinet called Little League, something called a medal game from a series that would follow. Medal games were so-called as the user would swap real currency in arcades at the time and used medals to play the cabinets. While many of the medal games simulate gambling, you couldn't trade the medals back for cash. More often, they would be exchanged for prizes, buy paper tickets, or more medals to play other games. Now, let me... Well, let's just go off script here for a moment. The old um, medal games, these things were more like sort of gambling machine, you know, <laughs> where you would put... like You kind of put a coin... It was the Little League, it was baseball-themed. Yeah. You put a coin in the top and it kind of works its way down and you kind of bet it's very hard to find evidence of this game you can see pictures of it but to yeah. understand how it works is very hard but let's face it it's not what we would call a video game no and anyone who's played forgive me the indulgence here Tom Yakuza Sometimes when you play the gambling games in there, you kind of have to, frustratingly, you have to swap your money for tokens. Yeah. And then you can win big in the casino. But you can't, because when I played that one time, I needed some money quick. And I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I've just uncovered the casino. I'll go down there. All right, to play the game, you've got to swap out for credits. Fair enough. Fine. That's, that's not a problem. Swapped out for all these credits. Won big on the gambling. Thought, oh, yeah. I'm someone. I can get myself out of this hole that I'm in. Went to cash them in. Look at what you can buy. You can buy some health. You can buy this. But you can't have money. Oh, no, no, no. (laughs) So that's obviously a little bit of a theme in Japan. And anyone who's been to the fine town of Skegness and played some of the... Oh, like the Namco arcade things. Yeah, where like you, Whack-A-Mole and yeah, yeah. You know, those strange fishing games. And you get like a, a million tickets and you can get a, a drumstick. Exactly. exactly. Four million that. tickets equates <laughs> to one drumstick lolly. Yeah. That, just so everyone can relate to it, is what a medal game is. So what was their first game? The first game, as we would recognise, it was an arcade title called Vulgus. Burst into the now burgeoning arcade scene. 1984. Wow. This is the year I was born. Really? Crikey. Well, there's two of our birthdays in there. 1979 and 1984. And something tells me you're 
old before your time. <laughs> uh, well, we've got a listener comment next. Yeah, who we got first? Who's we've got this? the good old The Chronicles of a Gamer. He says, I definitely loved a lot of their beat em ups, most notably Cadillacs and Dinosaurs and Alien vs. Predator. To add, I remember wasting rolls of quarters on these games with my uncle, uh, Uncle Tom, and my cousin Tommy. I also must add that their Dungeons and Dragons beat em ups are some of the best beat em ups ever made. I also think that Mega Man is up there for greatest platformer ever. Capcom was a true powerhouse. Hmm. What do you reckon to that? Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, you ever seen that? I haven't, mate. I've seen Aliens vs. Predator. Um, the arcade game? I think I've seen the console version. Is it the same premise? or From, from memory, I think Alien vs. This is where Chronicles of Game gets to touch and says, hang on a minute, I thought you two were gamers. <laughs> but I thought Aliens vs. Predator was more of a like a Turtles in Time style. Uh, Turtles in Time style. Oh, okay. Scroll, mm. scroll and beat him up. Scroll and beat yeah. him up. And uh, I think you played as Marines from memory. Uh, Cadillacs versus Dinosaurs. Somebody tells me that I saw a Mega CD release, but he's probably going to teach me on that. And it looks like he had a good time with Tom and Tommy Jr. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good name. And he also drops the uh, drops Mega Man, the greatest platformer ever. Tough as all nails, uh, Chronicles of a Gamer, but you have the skill set to pull it off. He does. Um, Capcom was a powerhouse, as we'll find out, if not wrong. And we'll get to Mega Man as we go forward. Following its release, they started to then port over to the Nintendo NES, uh, versions of their arcade games, starting with 1942 being published in 1985. They started to go well, and Capcom recognised the home console market was a good one for them. In the mid-1980s, they realised they may be able to cash in on this with a team of just six people. Can you believe that? They no. started working on their first original IP for home console use, Mega Man. This team, featuring a young Kenji Infune, credited in the game's credits as in a fuking set to work <laughs> designing <laughs> the enemies and game's characters. Hopefully that does not get us the explicit lyrics, because no. that is exactly as his name appears. Once he had drawn the concepts and visions for these, due to the lack of manpower, young Kenji even started to draw these as pixels within the game, transferring his concepts into the now legendary pixel art that stood as iconic artwork in themselves in the 8 and 16-bit eras. Now, one thing to be said about that is he was able... I think one of the things that works for Mega Man is the characters are very are very stylized. Yeah, and he they was do able have their own to, style, don't they? I think in a lot of these... They get a guy in, he draws all these different concepts and then moves them over and so on. So then try and work out how that's going to work in pixels. Yeah. Whereas due to the small team, this guy was able to take what he had drawn as a concept, which is often quite high brow for yeah. the 8 and 16 bit consoles, and then turn that into obviously you get like a, a grid, don't you, that you basically colour in the squares yeah. to make these sort of sprite characters work. I think that adds. That's added credence to it. Yeah, definitely. It's it's almost cutting out the middleman, isn't it? It's like he's got the idea. He can just do both things. He can vision it in his head, draw it, and then place it in, in the research pixel. as well. I do believe he also did the Japanese box art as well. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. A busy go. man then. Very busy. Writes the theme tune, sings the theme <laughs> tune kind of guy. <laughs> Let's take a moment to revert back to the blistering arcade scene and focus on another series that early Capcom would end up making legendary. Well, before we do, there's a listener comment. Uh, Comic Pictures 79, if you want to get any of our artwork of the show, T-shirt, The Man Who Finishes Games, which is a, a top seller. Top seller. So if you think that you finish games and you want to strut around in a T-shirt that says The Man Who Finishes Games. In your own home, though, due to... The pandemic that's out there. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was about to say something completely out there, like this this shirt would protect you from that, but obviously <laughs> it can't do that, can it? No. no not, not even wrapped around your head. No. no. Uh, anyway, so the big man himself, Comic Picture 79, says, Dude, Street Fighter, Resident Evil. Well, you've got a bit ahead of yourself here, Adam. Devil May Cry, Monster Hunter. These are just the recent franchises that are massive sellers. For many, Capcom are a name that is synonymous with quality, and I, for one, am really looking forward to this episode. Well, I hope you're tuning in, uh, Comic Picture 79. It's time for that legendary series we're talking about. 
The Street Fighter series. The original game in the series, obviously just named Street Fighter, was the brainchild of Takashi Nishiyama and Hiroshi Matsumoto. They would leave after the release of the game, though, and head over to one of Capcom's rivals, SNK, to work on the Fatal Fury series. The aforementioned Kenji Info... 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 <laughs> Put my teeth in. We'll leave it's that It's all in. right, we'll leave that Kenji one Kenji Infune in. got his big break as an artist on this game. Keen one to remember his ideas for Street Fighter came from Nishiyama learning different fighting styles in his spare time, and thus Street Fighter was born. Even you can see the influence there, can't you? Because Street Fighter has those distinctive styles for the characters... Sagat, Mutai, Ryu, sort of traditional karate. Um, Fei Long is Kung Fu. M. Bison can somehow float and do some kind of telekinesis stuff. But well, I don't think I so. Don't, I, I wonder whether he tried that one in his spare I time. I don't think so. Even with the pedigree of the people working on it, and despite ports to many, many machines, Street Fighter, hurt the original, didn't do very well. No. Final Fight, on the other hand, though, fared much better. Creator Yoshiki Okamoto cites the arcade version of Double Dragon as his influence, and as it was showcased around the arcade trade shows, it was done so under the moniker Street Fighter 89, as the sales division had been looking for a sequel to the original Street Fighter. Yeah, you've got to think about that. Obviously, Street Fighter hadn't done very well, but they were looking for a sequel. And old <laughs> Yoshiki thought he'd cash in on that by cranking that name on just anything that he could get out, just so he could get some Why backing not? for it. Yeah. Another listener comment. Retro Gamer Thomas, what does he have to say for himself? Well, it, on the subject of Final Fight, two of my favourites are Final Fight. Love playing that with my mates on my Mega CD, and Devil May Cry on my PS2 is awesome. Uh, and I'm discovering a lot more on my bar top, like Cadillac and Dinosaurs, etc., Plus, we mustn't forget Resident Evil. They started a whole gaming genre with that series. And listen, which, need uh, to just calm down. I know, we're not quite Part there two's yet. coming, isn't Part it? Part two is coming. It's in the pipeline. Well, getting a name change from the feedback groups said that it was nothing like the original Street Fighter game and inspired in many ways by the 1984 film Streets of Fire, Cody even being in directly or almost from the film <laughs> and based on the actor Michael Pear. Wow. There was a lot of that going. I mean, Sega's guilty of that when you play. Is it uh, Shinobi when you got the Batman boss and the? Oh, really? Yeah, and all that oh. sort of jazz. And in um, <laughs> Streets of Rage Two, you go through that. I know it's meant to be a ride, but it's very much like you're in Aliens, kicking your way oh, through Aliens. Yeah, yeah. If you remember, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean that fine. character. Sorry, you're all good. His character is very much like Blanker, isn't it? On that stage, the guy with like the. Oh, yeah. The long hair and the claws. He and even has the, the roll attack. Well, that was Final Fight, Tom. But it uh, was. Capcom, having previously worked with Disney by publishing the Hudson-produced Mickey Mouse Capade in North America in 1988, DuckTales became the first licensed game that they made for Disney themselves. Wow. Also got development from Mega Man's producer Takuro Fujawa and the character designer Kenji Infune. Infun oh, God's oh. sake. Don't worry. Infune. Disney requested some changes to the game, including the removal of crosses from the coffins in the Transylvania stage, replacing them with letters RIP, replacing hamburgers as power-ups with ice cream, and the omission of an option for Scrooge to give his money up, an action deemed too un-Scrooge-like. Mm -hmm. uh, another listener, Finster Gamer, being a Resident Evil bummer, I'm uh, going to be all over the later years episode. You see what he's done there? See what he's, he's done. Paid there. attention. Paid attention. Front of the top of the class, front of the school. Good work. As for the earlier years, I played a lot of the Capcom Disney games, like Aladdin, Ducktales on the SNES. The X Men games are great as well. My local pub has X Men Mutant Apocalypse arcade machines, so I still play it from time to time. Very nice. That's either got forgotten by the arcade man, or he died and uh, <laughs> forgot he'd been left there. Yeah. Uh, Ducktales was later ported to the Game Boy in the late 1990s. Uh, this version features the same gameplay, music, and levels of the original console release, though the layout of each level was changed to accommodate the handheld's lower resolution screen. Mm. Another listener all the way from the this good old... This guy knows some stuff, he doesn't does. he? does. The good old US of AR. American listeners do know their games. Capcom, what a company, says Daddy Zilla80. I will stick with what I know from this time period. Capcom took the Disney world by storm with the classic trio of DuckTales, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, and Darkwing Duck on the NES. I couldn't have asked for a better set of games during this time period. So much enjoyment playing them at my friend's house. 
Next up, we have the classic 1943 for the NES. Moving on to the SNES, two of my favourite games are Breath of Fire and Bonkers. Capcom did many great things for the gaming community, and I can't even picture a gaming history without them. Here, never, here. Never a truer word said. Well, it's time to move on to an even bigger game, Street Fighter 2, for many hailed as the most iconic fighting game ever. Final Fight made Capcom realise that a good fighting game could fill arcades, so they started to make um, this a priority going forward. Capcom's idea was to revive Street Fighter, a good idea, but to make it slicker and ultimately more fun. Yes, uh, it's time to jump in with the PlayStation Punk's comment. Loved all the Street Fighter games. My most memorable game was Marvel vs. Capcom. Nice game, Yeah, right? and we continue back with the, uh, the tale of making of Street Fighter 2. About 35 to 40 people worked on Street Fighter 2. Mm. Big Nori increased team there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, very much so. With Noritaka Funamitsu as a producer and Akira Nishitanti and Akira Yasuda in charge of the game and character design respectively. The game's development took two years and its combo system came about by accident. Here's a quote from uh, Noritaka Funamitsu. While I was making a bug check during the car bonus stage, I noticed something strange, curious. I taped the sequence and we saw that during the punch timing, it was possible to add a second hit and so on. I thought this was something impossible to make useful inside the game as the timing balance was ho so hard to catch. So we decided to leave the feature as a hidden one. The most interesting thing is that this became the base for future titles. Later, we were able to make the timing more comfortable and the combo into a real feature. In Street Fighter 2, we thought if you got the perfect timing, you could place several hits, up to four, I think. And we managed to place eight. A bug, maybe. Hmm. So quite interesting how like developers find things just almost by accident and then take them that step further and Definitely. produce them into well, different can you, ideas. Can you imagine a Street Fighter game without being able to chain combos? Or any fighting game, really? Absolutely, since. yeah. That you that you haven't been able to chain a combo. I with. mean, all the way up to Street Fighter Four and Five now, where you're knocking out like massive combos, and it just yeah, it makes you feel like a bit of a badass when you're playing, doesn't it? Especially Very much. If you're putting the hurt on someone. Let's give you a little funny story, actually, just while we're on the subject of Street Fighter. Okay. So um, went to EGX Game Show a few years ago, and um, we. We uh, sort of went to the arcade retro area and where they have uh, rows of all the old consoles lined up. And you can just, it's a good place to go because it's quite quiet. Obviously, a lot of people are there to play the latest stuff and the queues yeah. are massive. So that's where we go for a bit of a chill out at the end of the day and just have a few matches on some classic sort of two player games where you can just sit next to each other. Yeah. So me and my mate sat down. We um, went on Street Fighter. We did two and then four. Um, I think they had three on the Dreamcast, but it wasn't uh, the sort of people playing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, my mate put a bit of a whooping on me. His head's getting a little big. And then this guy just sort of walks up. He's like, can I play you? My mate's like, yeah, sure, bring it on. What my mate doesn't realize is this guy does his rucksack, places down his own little fighting stick he's brought with him, <laughs> and proceeds to batter him. Gives him a damn good thrashing. Sends him on what, his way. A couple of perfects? A couple make of perfects. Well, no, he, he got a few hits on him. I'll not, not discredit him too much, but he uh, he certainly put the hurt on my friend there. Wow. Okay. Well, much like Fortnite in this day and age, Street Fighter 2 was ported to everything, including Spectrum and Game Boy. This obviously affected its quality and playability. I've got a little story for you here. I had an Atari ST uh, when Street Fighter 2 was all the rage, and obviously yeah. I didn't have a console. Okay. As much as I wanted one. <laughs> you you know, you see that meme where it's like, you know, I, I want X and it's like mum says, well, we, why do you need X when you've already got X oh, at home? Yeah. And it's like a Mickey <laughs> Mouse version of it. Uh, I I ended up, pick, I really want, everyone, everyone at school was raving about Street Fighter 2. Yeah. Um, often makes me a little bit paranoid with my kids. Oh, are they struggling on with like the equivalent of Street Fighter 2 on the ST when their friends are all playing it on the X, Y, and Z? And it's like, yeah. oh God, am I doing it? Am I doing enough as a parent? <laughs> and uh, the, I was, um, so I decided I want, I want, I want a Street Fighter 2 experience. Okay. So I went and got it for the Atari ST. And um, 
I didn't even have a control. I had a joystick, <laughs> oh, like mate. a flight sim joystick. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> obviously it only had one button. <laughs> so you're moving with obviously the stick and then just pulling the trigger. Pulling uh, the trigger and I think it was like trigger and up and left for a punch and oh maybe my. down and left for a kick. And it was virtually unplayable. It came on several discs. Yeah. So you would you'd put the disc in. Well, um, so w- sorry to interrupt. Was it the same as the Mega Drive and SNES versions, uh, or were the graphics downgraded as well? And I, it's been a while since yeah. I've even looked at the box. I ought to get that out and put it on display, really. But get uh, it on the shelf. You put it I on. Play the a shelf. lot of games. Yeah, play <laughs> a lot of games. Uh, I'd love to get the ST. Wh- I would love to get my beloved Atari ST working again. I what do you think the problem is with it? I know exactly. Everything is working fine on it, but they had an Achilles heel of the joystick ports, and everyone's like, oh, joystick extenders. I had joystick extenders. Yeah. So because the ports were underneath the Atari ST, so you had to lift it up <laughs> and then pull yeah. this, the... Um, Sounds logical. Yeah, pull the... It was ba- The Atari ST, I don't think, was ever devised <laughs> as a gaming machine from the get-go. <laughs> Uh, and most parents <laughs> bought their kids the Amiga, yeah. which is probably a lot more well known. And the RS, the Atari ST, was its like uh, alternate. Pr- was the alternate product in the marketplace, and I had that. Yeah, um, it was good at some things. It wasn't good at others. You know, if you wanted to play sim games, the Atari ST could manage that. But if yeah. you wanted to play Street Fighter, probably not a good <laughs> idea. And even the Amiga suffered from disc swapping malarkey. As another funny aside as well. When I had that uh, um, Street Fighter game, um, you know, sometimes when your parents' family, uh, parents' friends come round and they bring their kids with them. This, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, some friends of my parents came over and they brought their kid. Yeah. Who was much younger than me. And uh, he saw the Street Fighter box. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll get that down. So one disc to load up the fight select screen. Yeah. You pick your fighters, and depending on which fighters you picked, you had to load another couple <laughs> of discs in to get this <laughs> thing to the point where you could fight. And I was trying to be all fancy and, and do the moves, which was obviously very difficult with one joystick, a joystick yeah. with one button on it. And he just hammered the hell out of the fire button. <laughs> and he owned me on that game <laughs> completely. I was trying to Sometimes like the way, isn't it? It is. You just have a, a random friend turn up or someone you know and they're like, oh, I can have a go at that. And they'll just put a mash because they don't know what they're doing. So I find but you, you can't get close game. to them. You're just getting yeah. like Hadouken from the other side of the screen and getting absolutely wrecked. Absolutely. Well, we better get back to it. Where are we at, dude? Uh, oh yes well we got uh, Capcom was so prolific in this time with many hits such as Ghosts and Goblins its sequel Ghouls and Ghosts Breath of Fire Bionic Commando X-Men The Children of Atom and obviously the Disney tie-ins that Daddy Zilla mentions yep. there's a lot of games that we could have gone into but without making this a three, four, five, six part epic uh, we had to keep it relatively light so uh, we had to gloss over quite a few of them. But uh, one thing is for sure, though, Capcom was the last major publisher to be committed to 2D games, so this was not entirely by choice. The company's commitment to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, as it's known as its platform of choice, caused them to lag behind other leading developers in developing 3D-capable arcade boards, which are now becoming all the rage. That's one thing I I remember of being a, a child of the time, you would they w- they just past this moment where you would walk into an arcade. These things existed back in the day, uh, and even the we've talked about it before in the transition from SNES to PlayStation. People had kind of got bored of side-scrolling platform games, oh yeah, fighting games, yeah. and all of a sudden you walked into an arcade, and you know you saw something like Virtua Fighter, and yeah. as impressive as Street Fighter and maybe even Mortal Kombat were at the time, and and I think they've aged a lot better than the original Virtua Fighter. Oh, absolutely. You look at it, when you walked in at the time, you w- you were wowed by this thing that was working yeah. in the 3D space, and kind of, you looked over at the things that looked like a comic, and were like, no, you know, I, mm. you know, these feel like they've had their time. Yeah. So it was a, I don't know, it was a bit of a, they were kind of trapped in that era, weren't they? And I think there's a lot to be said about pixel art, and a style and an era of gaming that was kind of at that moment for a while anyway parked or they never 
they were trying to grind their gears, especially in the arcade, and it just seemed like we got another version sure. of Street Fighter. And we yeah, got another version Treading of Street water Fighter. A and it bit. felt like the same game getting cropped out. Yeah. I mean, definitely. is that what killed arcades, or is, is there something more malevolent that killed arcades? I think it's a victim of its own success, really. Like, arcades were obviously proved very popular, and then companies looking at bringing that to everyone and yeah. getting it in people's homes, and you got the consoles started really kind hitting the shelves. Well, such a solid and eloquent point from you. Not bad for me, is it? No, it's good. Polish out a good one when I can. A turd. Uh, polish a turd. <laughs> shine her up real nice and <laughs> present it to you. Um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of what happened, isn't it? It's like, I, I used it as an example. I probably spoke about it before on the show, but playing virtual tennis in the arcade with uh, mm. one of our other cousins other on cousin. holiday. And, yeah. and then you going, I've got that at home. I'm like, what are you talking about? I've got it on the Dreamcast. Oh, uh, have you? Well, let's yeah. see it then. That looks just like the arcade one. Plays just like the arcade one. Yeah. Ah, there you go. That was a good Pretty game. I, th I think it's a shame. I'd, I'd love to see a bit of a resurgence of arcades and getting kids out of online. The thing is, when you um, go, let's say you go, you go down Skeggy. Yeah. You, know, you go. Everyone down. goes to the arcades, though, don't they? Well, they do, but uh, what I find is what I find disappointing is when I go to Skeggy, there are some coin op cabinets that me or you and our listeners would class yeah. as an arcade game. Uh -huh. Something we can get ahead round and understand is an arcade game. There's an awful lot of, as we mentioned in the beginning of the script, what they used to call those metal games. Yeah. They seem to be the popular, the predominant. I don't even know if they're popular. That's really all you can get. I your think it's on. almost like trying to bring forward the idea of a loot box in real life is like. Here you go, pump all your money into this and spend some time doing this and you'll get enough tickets for that. A ramble of tokens and issues so yeah. get a drumstick <laughs> lolly or a key ring. Yeah. Um, I mean I think I think I'd love to look at arcades in a in a in a deeper dive episode and I think we could discuss a lot there about where they went. But just before we close on talking about arcade quickly, they're still making the odd few. Luigi's Mansion had one, um, a few years ago, I remember seeing a uh, listener, Daddy Zilla, mm. posting a few pictures of that. Um, and he's a big champion of uh, arcade cabinets. So, yeah, we'll maybe have a look at that in the future. But let's, uh, let's close things out. Yeah, to finish as a little tease, so when we re re revisit the story of next time, we pick up part two of the history of Capcom. Capcom. Sweet Home, a game based on the 1989 film of the same name, but the writers took some liberties <laughs> and expanded on the film's plot. The game's plot ended up diverging somewhat from the films. It was unprecedented at the time for a video game to expand on a film's narrative in this way. Sweet Home was released for the Famicom in Japan on 15th of December 1989. It was promoted alongside the movie in the film trailer. Huh. Many believe the game's gruesome imagery dissuaded Nintendo from releasing the game outside of Japan. The developer wasn't finished with Sweet Home, and after its release, Takuro Fujiwara began the development of Resident Evil, mm. which was led by Shinji Mikami. It went through several redesigns, initially conceived as a snoof Super NES game in 1993, then it moved to a fully 3D first-person PlayStation game in 1994. Well, that's, as we say, the full turn of the wheel, so keep your eyes peeled for when we revisit the story of Capcom and complete the saga. Tom, new listeners will wonder who the hell Stingray is, but uh, when we were growing up, he was the guy that used to come around delivering pirate videos. He was, and various other items that may Through him, we now use him as the medium of how we recap this week's new release highlights. I feel if he was around nowadays still, he'd definitely be peddling those hand sanitizer and dust masks wouldn't he that's the sort of character he was he was yeah uh, finger on the pulse hand in the wallet yes but more often than not his counterfeit goods <laughs> weren't so great were they <laughs> it's time for a peek in what we affectionately call Stingray's boot what's there some between some counterfeit nappies and a dodgy copy of Battle for Endor this week so these are the new release highlights for the week March 9th to March 15th 2020 listeners these are out on digital or physical or will be by the time this podcast in your feed but could be region dependent. Tom, spring stop, Wattle and Wall. He drove up the drive. He's stopped where he is. He's popped the boot. 
Let's have a look what he's got. He looks quite menacing. He's got a lamp on his bottom lip. What are you picking out first? Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Ooh. Available on the PC and Xbox One. Obviously available on Xbox Games Pass, to those of you who have got it. Great, great title to get on there. Great service. Yep. March 11th. Uh, embark on a new journey in a vast exotic world where you'll encounter towering enemies and challenging puzzles on your quest to unravel Ori's destiny. We also need to uh, explain to the wave of new listeners that we pick out a mummy mummy. So the game you we would do. have begged mummy mummy for back, for back in the day. And we yeah. also pick out a VHS. We do. To take home with us just to give that nod to our retro childhood. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pick out this next, Hidden Through Time, PC, PS4, Xbox and Steam. Most powerful gaming console on earth, as we often say. March 12th, embark on a colourful... They're not getting anything on Steam bar tat, though, are they? <laughs> uh, surprise, this isn't a Switch game. Hidden through time, as I say, March 12th, embark on a colourful hand-drawn journey of discovery through the ages, from missing dinosaur eggs in the Stone Age to a king's crown in medieval times. Can you find them all? Discover, create, and share worlds with your own hidden treasures in Hidden Through Time. Next up on the Switch, we've got Overpass out March the 12th. A rhythm adventure from a new perspective. Drive and drift to the beat on a futuristic road trip uh, through trippy music where the skyline is always in sync. Hmm. Next up. Uh, Artificial extinction. Well, hang on a minute, though. I'm just looking... Oh, are you I'm going for a pick, are you? I'm looking through to decide... I know what my pick is, and I think you'll guess. Is yours the final one? It is. Oof. Not left you much there, have I? No. I tell you what. Do you wanted to say Ori was yours? No. Well, no. it deserves it. I know it does, but. I'll, I'll say Ori was mine, and you can have the last one if you want. No. Okay. I've picked mine. If you take Artificial Extinction. Okay. We see how many of these do we see in the boot? Blooming tower defense nonsense. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> o- off you go. <laughs> Artificial Extinction available on the PC March 13th. You have nine days to find a safe place in the planet. Your ship is low on fuel and you have to land. Set up sentry guns around to defend yourself while you collect more fuel for the ship. AI-controlled drones and tanks attack you to try and find a weakness in your defences. This is my mummy mummy. (laughs) Dead or school, PS4 Switch, March 13th. Underground dwelling girl Hispano is aiming for the surface in a zombie-infested Tokyo. Hack and slash RPG. Obtain weapons and gear from enemies and customise your skill tree to create your own unique and powerful character. I laughed at the start, but that actually sounds pretty good. Exactly. One thing, let's get our VHSs out of the way. What's your VHS? Due to my uh, game playing experiences this week, I'm going to go for the very first Mad Max, the Road Warrior. Not a not a massive success when it first came out, but it got a very big following eventually. Mm. To me, when I watched that, when I was young, I was really young when I watched that. It felt like a horror film. Oh yeah, definitely. It's the scariest out of all of them. I just find the characters real sinister, and it's that point of like where the world's not fully gone yet, but it's just reached a point where it's not a very nice place to be. Mm. And you kind of, the two hospital scenes, I think, where Goose, oh God, yeah. spoilers for a 30 year old film, but Goose is gone. It's not Goose, is it? It is Goose. I think it is Goose, yeah. Yeah. I was saying Goose Top Gun, Goose Mad Max. Sidekick character name. Um, steady. <laughs> steady. Um, yeah, he, he's he gone, and then Max's wife and child are gone. It's, it's pretty brutal. Oh, yeah. I mean, his revenge is good, but he doesn't, almost doesn't quite get it. Anyway. I like you. I found that quite disturbing. I it think was one of the first films I'd seen as well that didn't have a happy ending. You know, normally, yeah, yeah. You know, he's it, just he just drives off. There's no happy ending to no. that film. Um, and it, it because of its low budget, um, apparently George Miller had to like cut a lot of corners, and he um, he they, they like did filming on the roads and stuff without permits and etc. So and he had to pay some of the extras in beer and various stories you hear. It feels low budget, so it feels almost more real. So you're like, wow, is that what Australia's like? I don't want to go there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, what's your VHS pick, um, dude? Let's go with Pinhead. Let's go with the original Hellraiser. Ah. Nod to one of our law yeah. listeners, Harvey Retro. I'm sure he's a fan of that. 
Must be. Lob it out there. It's the sort of thing that Ray had in the boot yeah. that always scared the living daylights out of me. Again, a bit like, well, not like Critters, where it was <laughs> like, you know. Comedic. You, look at, you looked at it and thought, oh, that might be for kids. I might get that. And then you ended up terrified. <laughs> Hellraiser was one of those VHSs that you just didn't even want to have the Battle for Endor touching in the back of Stingray's yeah. boot because you thought, thought the evil may seep through and infect you. Very nasty Absolutely. piece of work. Yeah. Um, next, we've got my... No, I'll take this Oh, yeah, you better take this next one. Because then, my pick. seamlessly, like a local radio show, you get to finish <laughs> on your mummy mummy. My Hero Wants Justice 2. So good they made a sequel. Out on PC, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, March 13th. My Heroes 1 Justice 2, the overtop follow-up to the smash hit 3D arena fighter, My Hero 1. Justice makes its heroic debut. Make full use of the character's quirks as you clash head-to-head in epic battles across huge, huge arenas. Huge arenas. Send us to the bridge, Tom. This is my pick. My mummy mummy of the week. Mummy mummy. Mummy mummy. (laughs) Mummy. (laughs) <laughs> that's how I've got to say it every week. Now. Every week now, that's how it's happening, is it? Uh, Neo 2, available on the PS4 today, March 13th. Defy your own morality and unleash your inner darkness. Mortality. Mor- it's not a game about whether, mortality. You, look, whether you do upskirting or anything. <laughs> it's more about... And unleash your inner darkness across the violent feudal land of Sengoku-era Japan. Yeah. And the deadly dark realm in the Savage Action RPG sequel. I played the demo of that, which I talked about last week. Really impressed with it. I can't quite afford to get that and Doom next week, so it will so be... So you're getting this because it's the better game? No, I think I think for me, Doom will be the better game, but I'm still really interested in that. Why you do you say some your very head? strange things? To me, personally, like I'm not saying every person going to like... You don't really even like Doom. I like the new Doom. I love the one that I played on the Switch, the reboot, or okay. whatever you want to call All it. Right. Just well, Doom. Hopefully you support Nintendo and get that on the uh, Switch. No, I won't. Oh. No, I did make a promise, and I was like, obviously, I thought, I need I need something to play on the Switch one Christmas. I was What's like, going to make Doom. them keep bringing the bigger boy games to that? Game Boy Color they have <laughs> if you don't keep supporting it. All you're going to end up getting is... I'm not falling for that. Because there's a lot of people who solely only own a Switch. If you own a PS4 and a Switch, that's like saying, I'm going to buy The Witcher 3 for the Switch when I've got a, an Xbox One X or a PS4 Pro in the room. You just wouldn't do it, would you? Some people buy two copies. Well, you, you, some people buy two copies if they've got the money. I haven't. Um... If if you want the portability of it, I suppose that's one appeal. But for me, I want the old 60 FPS. You took money, extra very money nice screen. last week to go I get know. an Xbox One discless. Did I? And you didn't even buy one? No. What have you spent that on? I don't even want to know. Let me ask you the question that's on everyone's lips. What are you hoping to play? I'll be hoping to play Doom. But um, Dude, by park the end it, of next park week. Park your face. What are you hoping to play over the next seven days before oh, Doom spe- comes out? I suppose I better be playing um, more Mad Max. Yeah. If I'm you double defin- down, if you double down. How, how? Okay, okay. How long did that take you to finish? Hours wise. Give me numbers. Give me. Oh, numbers. you don't want to know because oh, I did all. This, well, I didn't do all of them, but I, I don't want to do many side quests because I just want to get it done. Which whose camp are you at? Uh, oh God. Are you he is. It's a big ship. <laughs> an old ship <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm in for a long journey when most of the map's not unlocked <laughs> you've got a while to go yet sunshine well it'll just be online shooters for me then no what I would say is if you grind it out tomorrow I don't have that time anymore if you grind it out tomorrow night and don't play those online shooters for one night you get the back of it broken, and from there it's just a downhill I've, journey. I've made a promise to myself, though, when I get the big hitters like Doom, Final Fantasy VII, Last of Us, Ghost, I'm banning my online playing because there's too much of a distraction. Why don't you just ban it for this weekend and get Mad Max done? Because I prefer it than Mad Max, whereas I know when I get stuck into those story-driven games that... Oof, God. 
like you're serving me up a It's like a little addiction, I think, online shoot. Well, just online games. I'm just not into life. injecting that. No. Not at all. I know you're not. I know you're not. I just we all have advices. I'd quite like you to... S- I'd, cr- I'd really quite like <laughs> you to finish Mad Max. I'd love to talk to you next episode about the end game. And I just feel if you don't get it done this weekend, we're never going to be able to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, you're probably right. Doom. Yeah. And then by the, I'll struggle to get that done in Card time. and all that other nonsense will be there when you get back from the wasteland. I don't know. Double down. Double down. What else? Those online shooter nonsense. You can maybe play that on Wednesday. Is that when I'm allowed? You're allowed again on okay. Wednesday. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you're allowed. And you're going to get Doom next week? Launch launch day. Although I'll have to come and record this. Yeah, well we've got we'll a six-hour show. Oh, have we? Yeah. yeah six or seven, I want a brief show, show next week. Yeah. I want to be on my way. Any briefer than this, and there's no point even turning on the Mac. We might not even be recording next we week will. if it goes serious. It'll be a one-man show. Well, we could just do it over Skype, couldn't we? If it's that bad. I don't think it's got that charisma. No, it doesn't, but... You can don a face mask. If the fans demand it, maybe. I w- if the fans demand it, I will walk through hell on earth to come record. Well, they're going to need something to keep them occupied when they're staring at the walls. They will. Anyway, this is going to date this show, isn't it? Yeah. This conversation. Well, we're going to be there for all of you. We're going to make be. sure we provide you with some top class entertainment. There'll be no news. <laughs> yeah. And the electric will be off, so me and you all have played Nort what you've been playing, Norts and Crosses, Snakes and Ladders, <laughs> Cluedo, Clue if you're from America, uh like that. Ended up in an endgame sequence where <laughs> Professor Plum with a pie <laughs> in the dining room. What are you gonna be playing this week? Uh what I just said. No. Okay. What, what, <laughs> <laughs> what am I what am I really gonna play? Um I'm gonna finish that sequel Transformers game. Yeah. Fall or War, I always get them mixed up. I get that done. Um, thoroughly enjoying it, and I'm I'm in the end game now. I'm in the end game. Um, might pick up the Nino Kuni save. I'm still battling on with that, although <sighs> patience is wearing thin. To be fair, <laughs> patience is wearing thin. That's how I felt with the sequel. I've just so. got the new gameplay mechanic as well. I don't know, twenty, thirty hours in. What's going to be your next new game? Like as in release, like we do new now releases. You see, what I've been doing, it, if I've been prepare, preparing for lockdown. <laughs> oh, right, So okay. I've got stacks of stacks of retro games to play through yeah. that I maybe didn't get the chance to play. Because I'm in your situation, I was in your situation that you're in now with young family and all that. Yeah. Mine, bigger boys and girls now. Breaking can, the fourth can, wall, obviously. Yeah, you can get to enjoy your time. I can go back the games, and play the games the I didn't get to play back in the day, uh, yeah. like Dead Space. So I'll be going back and playing that. Uh, like I say, I like that game. But yeah, there's a big old era there that you probably, yeah, you played some of the, the key titles, but a lot of them you, you probably missed just because of not having enough time. Money. Money as well, yeah. It's, a, it's an exp- I always say... I don't think it's an expensive hobby for what you get out of it because you oh get no. a lot of entertainment for a lot of the games we pick up. We get a lot of hours worth of, of entertainment out of those. It's always a big step up when you have to get a next-gen console like the new generation. Mm. You always have to steep up a bit more cash, uh, especially if you want to upgrade the TV. It's become like a little bit of the norm now. Like We had the HD TV sets with um, 360 PS3 and then 4K and... We'll obviously keep seeing that change, um, but yeah, it it's worth it. It's worth uh, spending a little bit of spare money. I do have on. Uh, oh, one th- one other thing. Yeah, I've recently acquired a PlayStation. Yeah, they're called PlayStation TVs. Basically, a Vita with an HDMI out, so okay. you can uh, you can also remote play. So I'm going to put that in. Look out. Look out. I'm going to put that in uh, one of the bunker's antechambers. So uh, wherever I throw my mattress down to sleep on. In the wherever I lay my hat. Thousands of rooms that we've got. Yeah. I can now um, plug in this PlayStation TV and remote play with my DualShock 4 my PS4 to that other TV. Or I can 
download Vita games to it, and that also includes the PlayStation One Classic games. Yeah, or that'd be cool. I can play pop some of those in on the small one of my screen. Vita cards and play some of those on the big screen, which is uh-huh. actually quite exciting. So, do you think that will pixelate them a little bit, uh, or the resolution will not be quite up to scratch? I'm pretty confident it's going to be really good, actually. Yeah, yeah, I am. I've been wanting one okay. for a while because obviously the Vita's all right, but if you're at home, you kind of want to play on yeah. the bigger boy screen. But some of the Vita, look out! I'm having a go at it now, punching the recording studio. I uh, I like. A lot of the Vita games actually hold up, and you'd want to play them on the bigger screen. Obviously, when you come back, you're kind of a little bit sort of locked into the Vita's ecosystem. So, be able to display those on the big telly uh, mm-hmm. would be uh, would be a real joy, and may yeah. actually make me revisit uh, some of my saves on there. Persona mm-hmm. Four, Uncharted, Golden Abyss. Yeah, would be a nice game to uh, play while you're getting your Zeds in. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I think that's it. I think that's all we've got time for. As always, thank you, uh, thank you for your time this week, listeners. As always, thank you. We look. F- oh, hold on a minute. Start again. It's all right. It's late. And the me hour and James is late. have got a lot of work to do to <laughs> stitch this show together because there were very many, many, many badly pronounced Japanese names. <laughs> And we o- and we left in my mistakes, so you can imagine how many edits that we had. Anyway, that's <laughs> all we have time for this week, listeners. As always, thank you for your time. We look forward to the pleasure of speaking to you again next week. Until then, happy gaming. Remember, there's nothing wrong with being given the unofficial controller. It's what you do with it that counts. See you, Tom. See ya.